Obviously, we've all got questions for God. But as it turns out, he's got questions for us too. Why these questions though? Morning. It's still me. Uh, I, just, I just had to lose the jacket. You guys have seen me sweat. Uh, it's a lot. Um, well, today we're going to continue on in this series that we started at the beginning of the month um, called God's Got Questions. But before we dive into that today, I want to just uh, remind you that today after our second service at about uh, 12, 15, 12, 30, we are hosting our Discover class. And it's something that we do once a month here at South Hills. And uh, essentially, if you are new to our church, you're trying to figure out, like, how do I get involved? Uh, why do you guys do what you do? What is it that you value? How'd you get here? Why is this place so quirky? Um, those are all questions that we answer in our Discover class. Uh, it's around round tables. And uh, I and the rest of the staff sort of co-teach it together. And not only that, but you get a chance to sit around round tables and meet other people that have been going here for a while, some people that are new just like you. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to make new connections and figure out, like, what's next for me? Uh, maybe I've been attending a service, but what beyond that is a way I can get involved and make friends and grow in my faith? And so we'd love to have you out uh, today. For those of you that are at this service, it means that, uh, you know, you could go grab some coffee somewhere you know, put on a pair of shorts, whatever you want to do, come back and then have lunch with us. We're going to serve free lunch and there's free child care. So it's basically a free day date. So you're welcome. Uh, come out and hang out with us this afternoon. We'd love that. Uh, and with that, we're going to go into week three of our series, which is really asking the questions that God asks us in scripture and sort of chewing on them a little bit, mulling them over. Uh, there are all sorts of places in scripture where God asks questions, the Old and New Testament. And uh, these questions are not just directed at the people he's asking, but they're really directed at all people. Uh, they're questions about what it means to be human. They're questions that get us to wrestle with existential issues that we all encounter whether you believe in God or the Bible or not. And so we've just been taking four of them. There are a lot more in Scripture. Maybe we'll circle back to this subject again someday. But we've chosen four key ones, and today we're going to dive a little bit deeper down that path. So I want to encourage you, take some notes today. Write down some things that jump out at you. Uh, you can take pictures of the slides, whatever you want to do to sort of remember what's going on today and have a conversation about it later. But the title of my message today is, Hey, While You're Up... Hey, while you, how many of you heard this uh, from somebody around your house? Uh, was it after they tricked you to get up and then they said, hey, while you're, this happens to me all the time at, at my house, probably happens to my wife even more because she is home with our children uh, more. But there have been so many times, more than I can count, where I will come home and I'm like getting home from work. And the first thing when I walk in the door, my kids are like, hey, dad, um, hey, uh, can you grab me that real quick? And the thing that they're asking me to get is like five feet away from them, okay? It's literally something where if they would just like, uh, just engage your core, buddy, and you could grab it. You could wrap some fingers around it. You could have that so quick. Usually when they ask me to get it for them, they're like, hey, dad, could you grab me that thing right there? At that point, me at the door and them on the couch, you are closer to it than I am. But they're like, but you're up. You're up and I'm not. I'm sitting. And the real issue isn't that they couldn't get it themselves. It's that they don't want to actually have to pause their movie or their video game and actually stand up and put in the, the excruciating effort to take three steps and grab the cup they forgot on the counter, right? Or grab the phone that they can see is receiving text, but they want to continue watching the movie and receive the text at the same time. And they're like, hey, while you're up, can you just grab that for me? And oftentimes, because I'm a nice dad, I'm like, no! Because <laughs> I'm trying to train them. You know what I mean? Like, everything can't be done for you. And you know this, if this has happened to you before, if someone asks you to do, like, this little favor, like, hey, while you're up, can you just do this? And if you say no, which you have a right to say, now you're the bad guy, right? 
How could you be so uncaring, so unloving, so inconsiderate that you would make me reach out and actually grab the thing that I want, even though you just came in the door and your hands are full of bags that you brought from the car? Um, And as annoying as this is, I'm going to wager that not only has this happened to you, but you have done this before, that you have said this to someone else. You've asked someone else to do something for you that you probably could do. You just didn't feel like doing it. You're like, I don't really want to. And whatever that thing was, was annoying enough at that moment for you to gripe about, right? But it wasn't annoying enough for you to actually get up and do something about. And I think a lot of things occupy this space. And I don't know what this moment looked like for you. Maybe, maybe you had a moment where you were like, you know what, somebody needs to say something in the next staff meeting. And a coworker was like, you could. And you're like, yeah, I'm probably not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> but someone should, you know. My wife and I, we're just not communicating. I don't know what's going on. I just, uh, we're just not on the same page. And someone was like, you know, there are literally therapists that specialize in that exact thing. And you're like, I'm not going to therapy. <laughs> uh, but I will continue to complain about our relationship. Um, This one happens to me a lot where people are like, wow, you seem to know a lot about so many subjects. Like, how do you know so much? What's your secret? And I'm like, I don't think it's a secret. I just read. And instantly the person's like, oh, yeah, (laughs) probably not going to do that. I'm much of a reader. It's way harder than Netflix. Uh, And I wonder if this happened to you, right, where you have asked someone how they did something because you kind of wanted to do it. And when you were sizing up the person, you're like, I mean... (laughs) No judgment, but if they can do it, it can't be that hard, okay? (laughs) And so how'd you do it? For real, for real. And then they tell you, and when they tell you, instantly you're like, I'm not going to do that. That, I thought was going to be easier than that, you know? Because I think a lot of times our perception of the things that we want to uh, accomplish or experience in life is like, I I, I just want it to work, but I don't want to work for it. I, I just want the thing itself to work. I just want it to happen but I don't want to have to put in all this effort to acquire it. In our culture, because of the way sort of our Western culture works and the way that technology has advanced, in a lot of our minds, if something requires too many clicks, calls, classes, steps, or shipping days, we're like, I'm out, okay, it's not going to happen, even if it's important. And there are some things in our lives that are important that we haven't really done anything about. Like, it's something that we're like, wow, this really does need to change. I wonder if you've ever become really fixated on a specific thing because you have this awareness that, like, this is a really big deal. This is a core issue for me. And if I could just change this, everything else would change. The problem is you don't know how to change that. And you've tried some things, and it didn't really work. And I think we can become so stuck and discouraged and frustrated that we just think like, well, I don't know what else to do. There's nothing more that I can do. So maybe someone else will come along and they'll be able to do it for me. I'll be able to say like, hey, I'm stuck. I can't do it while you're up. Maybe you could do it for me. And I think that there is a really interesting story in the Gospels about Jesus that highlights a situation just like this. I'm going to read it with you guys this morning. It's in John chapter 5, if you want to turn there or scroll there. I don't know what kind of Bible you're using. We're going to put it on the screen as well. John chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says this. Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches, crowds of sick people, Blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches, and one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him, he asked, would you like to get well? Now, I want to give you some context before we unpack this this story together. Jesus was Jewish, okay? So this means that he attended all three of the religious festivals in Jerusalem every year. The city's population uh, would swell to about 10 times its normal size. And as a result of that, those who were sick and diseased uh, would all sort of gather together and huddle under these big colonnaded porches uh, because that's where it was shady, and they would beg. It was by this really famous pool, the Pool of Bethesda, 
which was near the temple, and you sort of had to pass it on your way to or from the temple. And because Jews felt that caring for the sick, the poor, the widowed, and the orphan was core uh, to their faith. In fact, they believed it was their religious responsibility. Because they so wholeheartedly believed this, these beggars came and gathered because they were thinking like, man, I have a good chance to experience and receive some help. There was also a legend at this particular pool that every so often on occasion, an angel would come down at certain times a year, and would actually stir up the pool, and it would begin to bubble up, and the first person in the pool when this happened would be healed. And we don't really know if this ever happened, or if it was just a story that people told themselves to hang on to hope, but we do know that it did draw a crowd. And of all of the people on this particular day, Jesus, who's leaving the temple because he just experienced or was there for this religious festival, is walking through this area, which is packed with people. And for whatever reason, he spots one guy who's been sick for 38 years. By the way, the average life expectancy in Rome at this time in history is between 20 and 33, which means this guy has been suffering for longer than most people have been alive. Think about what that would do to someone psychologically. Because the truth is, like when you live with something for a long time, you start to feel like this is just the way it's always been and it's the way it's always going to be. Like you get to a point where you almost can't tell where it ends and you begin. And maybe you have something in your life that fits this description. Like maybe for you it's a physical problem like the guy in this story. Maybe it's a mindset. Maybe it's a job that you can't stand or a habit or an addiction that you can't seem to shake. Maybe it's the fact that you constantly keep connecting your life to all the wrong sorts of people and you're like, I did it again. You don't like that you are like this, but you you just can't stop. And maybe Jesus today is asking you the same sort of question. Do you want to get better? Do you want to get better? And maybe like the guy in this story, you're thinking what he would have been thinking. What a stupid question. Seriously? Of course I want to get better. Why would you even ask me that? And this is the way that this guy responds to him. He says, do I want to get better? Verse 7, I can't. I have no one to put me in the pool. When the water bubbles, someone always gets there first. I don't know if you noticed, he didn't really answer the question, which is so fun when you're trying to have a conversation with someone. And instead of answering the question, they spend their time telling you that it's a dumb question. And you really get nowhere. And the reason this guy responds this way is because in his mind, there is no use in wanting anything more or different because it's just not possible. He can only think of one way to solve his problem, and he can't do that thing. And so he just feels like, man, it's just going to be like this forever. But the question I think this story brings up, and I want you to think about or wrestle with this question in your life too. What if there were lots of creative solutions available to you if you were only brave enough to admit you still wanted one? I think sometimes we get frustrated because like this guy, we can only think of one way to solve the problem that we have and we can't do that, so we're doomed forever. Meanwhile, God looks at life differently and so I think a lot of times God looks at our situation and says, I can think of 1,500 ways to solve this problem, but you've given up on all of them because this one of them didn't work out for you. Maybe, in fact, Someone has even suggested to you that you uh, try a few other things, which we all love, right? Unsolicited advice, it's our favorite. Someone, like, I've noticed you're having this issue. Have you thought of it? And you're like, shut up or I'll murder you, right? You've been there. You were like, this isn't about you helping me. This is about me griping about what I'm frustrated about. Know your place. But the reality of it is, it's hard to find a solution when you no longer believe that one exists. And much like this guy in the story, I think a lot of us, when confronted with an ongoing issue, most of us obsess over what we can't do 
rather than act on what we can. And this guy's thought is, whether or not I want to be healed is not the issue here. The issue is you've got to be the first person in the pool. I don't know if you've heard the rules, Jesus. That's how it works. And no one will take me down there. If you think about it, it is not my fault that I'm still like this. It's their fault because no one will help me. And this is part of what Jesus is getting at in this question and exchange he's having with this guy. Maybe you don't need them to help you. Maybe there's still something else you can do. And when Jesus asks this man if he wants to be healed, what he's really asking is this. Are you willing to do what it takes to be healed? And when Jesus asks us the same question, most of us respond the same way. I can't. I can't. And we say this because we understand, at least intuitively, how healing works. We understand that it will require you to stop blaming others for what they won't do and for you to take action on what you can do. And for some of you, like this guy, you have lived with certain limitations for so long that even what you can do, even that feels impossible to you. And then Jesus says this in verse 8. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Anybody else find this offensive? Is it just me? I'm just like, I don't know. If I was one of the disciples, I'm like hiding behind one of those columns like, it's getting weird. (laughs) If I'm this guy, I am thinking, seriously, that is your magic solution? You think if I couldn't have done that on my own already, I wouldn't have already done it? You don't think I've ever been like sitting here for 38 years and be like, you know what? I should try standing up, you know, and just see if it works. Like that's never occurred to me. That's insulting on so many levels. But Jesus isn't blaming him here. He's saying like, listen, I know you may have tried this or done this before, but, but this is different because this is a faith ask that I am asking of you. And if you do the thing I'm asking you to do, I will do something that only God can do. And I want to tell you something that you may not want to hear this morning. The healing you need in your life often hinges on your willingness to participate. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, these four biographies of Jesus in the New Testament, like when he heals someone, he almost always instructs them to take some sort of action before he heals them. And here's the crazy part. His instructions are never easy for that person. They're always difficult and embarrassing and stretching and bordering on the impossible, which is why a lot of people replied, I can't. I don't know what your issue is, but I bet when you ask God for help, he probably said something like, yes, absolutely, I'd love to help you. Now here's what I want you to do. And what followed was probably something you did not want to do. Something that would be hard for you. Something that would require you to swallow your pride and admit your failure and face your demons and ask for help and burn your crutch and embrace accountability and make apologies and risk rejection and humiliation. And when you heard that ask from God, you were like, no thanks. You know, I'm looking for one of those, like more one of those like instant healings, you know, where I don't do anything and you just like do it all. And that's what you were looking for, and that's clearly what you asked for. And then God had the audacity to ask you to do anything. And that made you mad. Because you don't really want a miracle, you want a magic trick. But God is a healer, not a magician. And he knows that if you don't participate in your own healing, you may seem different but you won't actually be different. And here's what I wonder about your life. What have you determined is too high a price to pay for your own healing? Because whatever that thing is that God is asking you to do to participate is too embarrassing. It's too much work. It's too costly. It's too painful. It's gonna take too long. Or it just isn't the way you would have done it. If you were God, he should have consulted you. 
You're like, sure. I mean, I want to solve my money problems. I mean, I'm not going to go to that budgeting class, but like, yes, God, if you've got another way. Sure. I mean, I want to stop being angry all the time. If you'd help me, God, I mean, obviously I'm not going to forgive my father, but like, if you could figure out a different way for the rage to sort of dissipate in my life. Like, I mean, sure, I want to stop having high blood pressure, okay? But I'm not going to stop drinking gravy because it's delicious. <laughs> it's part of a balanced breakfast. In the story of Jesus' first miracle, his mother gives, I think, the best advice to anybody who is in need of a miracle. They're at this, this wedding, and they run out of wine and and she's like, Jesus, you can fix this problem. He's like, ah, you know, I'm not, that's not really my thing, but I, not really my time. And, and she's just like, no, no, you got this. And because it's his mom, he was just like, well, I guess I better do it, right? Because even Jesus was like, you got to do what your mom says, you know? <laughs> and this is the advice she gives. She looks at all of the servants that are standing around, and she says this, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. And they did. And what happened was the impossible immediately after. And so here's my question for you today. What is Jesus telling you to do? And why are you pretending not to hear it? Because I think we play this game with God. But the truth is getting well will require you to take action in an area that you have been avoiding. I wonder what would happen if you identified like just one area of your life today that you've already been talking to God about. You've had conversations with God about it, and he's already sort of made clear to you what he wants you to do to partner with him to get better, and, and you just don't want to do it. What if this time, instead of making excuses, you just did it? And I know you're thinking like, I will later, you know, but I, I live with this one ancient poet wrote in Psalm 119, verse 60. He says this, I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. And what he's saying is this, God, my temptation is to keep putting things off till later that you've asked me to do because I just, I know that once I get into it, it's going to be uncomfortable. But I'm going to make the commitment to you that as soon as I know God, what you are asking me to do, I'm going to immediately spring to action. As soon as I know what God is asking me to do, I'm going to get started right away that day. No delay. And maybe you're thinking like, okay, so basically we just heal ourselves. And that's not true. And this is one of the great paradoxes of faith, that there are certain things you can't do without God, and there are certain things God won't do without you. It was true in this story of this guy. He did what the psalmist suggested. He immediately responded, and this is what happened. It says this in verse 9 of John 5. The man, instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. And all the moms are like, see, even he knew you got to make your bed before you start the day. It's what responsible young men do. That's what my wife is thinking right now. Can I just tell you, you know what the most annoying part of this whole story is to me? One word. Instantly. Instantly the man was healed. Because I don't know about you, but it never really seems to work out that way for me, which I don't like. And I don't know exactly why, but sometimes God does heal people instantly, and sometimes he does so slowly over time. And this is what is frustrating about going to God with whatever it is that's going on with you, is that you don't get to dictate how your healing works. All you can do is take the action that God is asking of you. Because God's forgiveness always happens in an instant, but our healing often takes time. And I really do believe that God wants to do whatever miracle it is that you need currently in your life today. And I also believe that it is going to involve you taking a step of faith 
doing something that God is inviting you to do to put yourself out there in a way that he is specifically asking you to. You're going to have to take one step after another step after another step after another. And you're probably thinking like, what, there's more than one step? Are you kidding me? Thanks for nothing, God. It's 2024. Okay, if I can't get something immediately on my couch, half-dressed in pajama pants, I'm not interested. And if you knew me, God, you would already know that about me. And you would just give me whatever I want the way that I want it if you loved me. Am I the only unspiritual person that's ever had this conversation with God? <laughs> but in this story that we've been reading, this guy is healed instantly. And he's elated because now he can stand, he can walk around, he can use his arms and legs. He's not crippled and sick. He can do whatever he wants to, everything he's dreamt of doing for the first time in 38 years. In other words, when he originally was like, wouldn't it be nice to, those people aren't even alive anymore. And now he has the opportunity to sort of live it up. And he's like, man, I'm healed. It is time to party. And he kind of does. And then something interesting happens. It says this later in verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him and said, now that you're well, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. What? I feel like I grew up hearing this uh, story. I don't remember this part at all. Isn't it interesting what Sunday school teachers cut out of the story to make it palatable? I don't remember this in any of the color pages. Just Jesus finding a guy partying and be like, hey, remember when I healed you? Uh, maybe stop sinning or something worse is gonna happen. Like, what is happening here? Is Jesus threatening to punish this guy? Also, like, what could be worse than being sick and immobile for almost 40 years straight? And also, how is just sort of enjoying your life sinning? These are valid questions, but they stem from a misunderstanding of this situation as a whole. What Jesus is really saying here is now that you're better, don't stop doing what made you better, which is good advice that most people do not follow. Now that you're better, don't stop doing what made you better. And yet a lot of us can't seem to wrap our head around this. It's human nature to do the opposite. In fact, there's this one really interesting, very quirky proverb that says this. This is Proverbs 26, verse 11. Some of you might want to get a tattoo of it. It is beautiful and poetic. It says this. As a dog returns to its vomit... So a fool repeats his foolishness. It's both interesting and disgusting. It's the perfect 13-year-old boy proverb. It is everything that they're looking for. And this is why this is interesting. This is why this is applicable. Because we're all that dog. Like the minute we feel better, we forget what made us sick, and we crawl right back to it. I don't know if you've uh, seen a dog do this before. You see that the dog is miserable and the dog is like, I don't know what's causing this and the dog's looking at you for help and you're like, I don't know what to do. And finally the dog vomits and the dog is so happy and so relieved and its tail's wagging and it comes up and it snuggles up to you and you're like, buddy, good job, it's over. And then the dog kind of looks over and you're like, don't do it. And it's like, <laughs> well, what, what a... We, I remember eating that before, and he's walking, and you're like, don't, and it's like, you know, going down. You're like, this is a bad, I, do you not remember? Like moments earlier, that's what made you throw up, and it's like, this, maybe this time will be different. Maybe just two licks. I think this is probably why my parents wouldn't let us get a dog when I was a kid, now that I'm thinking back. But we do this too, Right? You know, I've lost a little bit of weight, so I, sh I feel like I should be able to eat whatever I want for the next year. Um, that's how I'm going to do things. You know, since I've been taking my psych meds, I feel a lot better, so I don't feel like I need them anymore. So I'm just going to take myself off them voluntarily cold turkey without consulting my physician. That seems smart. I've noticed that I, I make a lot better decisions 
when I make it a priority to come to church every single Sunday. I mean, I'm not going to in summer because it's sunny out, but like <laughs> other times I will because it's important unless I think of something that's, you know, I could do that's not that. And sometimes what we discover in this story is sometimes what God asks us to do is circumstantial, but often it's habitual. Often when God is trying to invite healing into our life, it's a habit he's inviting us to begin and carry out. And sometimes holding on to our healing means holding on to our habit. And the habit that healed this guy was choosing to trust Jesus and do what he said. And this is what Jesus is like running and intervening with him over is saying like, do you remember how you got here? You tried everything else and nothing else was able to heal you. You struggled for a super long time and I saw you and I came to you and I challenged you. And although you may have tried to pick yourself up before, you'd never done it with my help. You'd never done it my way. And when I challenged you to do that, you trusted me. You did what I said, and it changed your whole life. And then you walked away. And you were like, now I'm going to do whatever I want again. And I just want you to know, like, I love you enough to come and intervene again in your life and say, now that you're better, don't stop doing what made you better, or you're going to get sick again. And guess what? Next time, it may be worse. Next time, the physical consequences may be worse. Next time, the relational consequences may be worse. Next time, the emotional toll it takes may be much worse. I'm not threatening you. I'm telling you how life works because I love you. And I would also tell you that whatever next step God is asking you to take, it isn't just about you. It's about the ripple effect it'll have on every person and place connected to you. Because your next step will motivate others to take their next step. Committing to your process will inspire other people to step into theirs. You getting better will enable other people to believe that they can get better. Everyone at the pool that day watched this man who they thought would die, sick and crippled on this porch. The crowd grew silent and every single one of them watched him as he stood up for the first time in their lifetime. And he rolled up his mat and he walked away under his own power and it changed them. It changed them because they saw it and they thought, man, if he can do it, I can do it. If it's possible for him, it's possible for me. If God is good enough to heal him, maybe God will heal me. And here's the reality of you in your life. Somebody's watching you too. Maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your neighbors, your coworkers. It could be people that you would never even know look up to you or are studying you or just watching you from a side view. But I wonder what healing awaits you and those around you on the other side of your next step. And I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. In fact, it probably isn't. It's probably gonna be one of the most difficult things you've done. You are not gonna be able to do it without God's help, but it will be worth it. I'm telling you, whatever healing, whatever miracle that you are petitioning God for will require your participation. So if you're saying that's too far to go, it's too much to do, you are in the way of your own healing. And God wants you to stop stopping yourself from everything that he wants for you. It may not happen in an instant, but as we commit to and connect to God, he slowly brings into our lives what we need because what we need is ultimately him. I wanna pray this into your lives today. Would you just bow your heads across this room with me this morning? 
God, I'm so grateful for your love in our lives. I'm grateful that you give us life and you show us how to live. And I'm grateful that you want us to have life to the full. God, in scripture, you talk about being our guide. You talk about being our friend, our comforter, our counselor. God, you can be trusted. And God, I pray that as we petition you for what we need to see in our lives, for the breakthrough, for the healing in our lives, whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual, relational, God, that we would lean our ear in your direction and whatever you tell us to do, we take the words of Mary seriously. May we do whatever you say. And as we take steps in your direction, as shaky as they may be, may you walk us toward healing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.